isn't it gorgeous even on a gloomy damp overcast windy day to see the bees out in force i hope you could make them out amongst the lavender it's, they're packed in there i love it i feed them they pollinate my veggies for me and oh <laughs> cat, <laughs> cat fell off thanks rusty um just on that note i'm going to be speaking slightly more at length about the bees in a minute because something that's been brewing for a long time in my mind is starting to take shape and I want to tell you all about it I want to tell you how that's been influenced then we're going to go out into the garden and I'm going to show you where the changes will be happening all sorts of other things this afternoon um, and I'm going to talk about brassicas too because oh my goodness the first lot of brassicas I sowed, I think I maybe ended up with five or six plants. Pathetic. Fortunately, some of my neighbours had spares. Yay! So I took them in. Some I got into the ground already. You saw the cauliflower and the kale I put in. There's maybe about, I don't know, 11 plants there. Two of which have been had, I think. There might just be a tiny little bit of growth left, so I'm leaving them in. The rest, I've done exactly as I do in every other year. They're in pots, in trays, between the two rows of main crop potatoes, so they don't get too hot down there. They're covered in netting, so the butterflies, the cabbage whites can't get to them. And they look like they've been massacred too. I did a second sowing of brassicas, nothing whatsoever. But I've been rescued with, I've got to look on the table, three by five, 15 beautiful plants, a mixture of purple sprouting broccoli and cavolo nero. My two favourite brassicas, so thank goodness I've been rescued. And I've been rescued by Paul, yay, of Richard and Paul. So as I was mentioning uh, in the previous video, same day, I've just, oh did you my Tommy grumble? I've just changed my top <laughs> to help us differentiate between days, or it's the same day. So yeah, as I was mentioning, uh, at the beginning of the week, <gasps> hallelujah, I had my social bubble finally. So the gorgeous Richard and Paul uh, had a hire car for a week. They were going to be using it for a holiday trip that ended up being cancelled because all those things are cancelled however they decided to keep the car so that they could at least have some day trips out to the countryside to their favorite places check out on their youtube channel i'll do the link below uh, they've had a couple of day trips out to the chilterns just achingly beautiful rolling countryside and with the light changing all the time as the sun and clouds just dance across the land it's beautiful and Richard's composed all the music under it and it's it's just pure escapism so go and have a look um, so as part of their hiring car for the week they came and stole me away yay I don't want to use public transport at the moment even though we're allowed to I think really we should just because it's you know it's overcrowded at the best of times but I honestly feel like if you don't have to use transport don't leave the public transport for people who have to use it to get to work the rest of us wanting a day out a day to forget it just leave it for the folk who absolutely need it at the moment so they came over to pick me up by way of doing that we had a quick a little jaunt down to my garden so that we could catch up on what's gone on in my garden obviously i put both the boys to work straight away um and then we went off to theirs back over to their place in west london for a couple of days it was gorgeous it was perfect it was brilliant the hogs the first hogs oh my goodness i could have cried but i think i was grinning too much to cry anyway it was it was beyond perfect and we were all saying when they brought me back over to South East London, I think we got back over here about half eight, nine in the evening, that it actually felt like we'd had a whole week 
away. It was so lovely. Sorry, I'm digressing. Just a, <laughs> as a heads up, this is going to be a bit of a chatty one before we get to the garden, because uh, I want to explain about the garden in a second. But anyway, as part of them coming over here, because <clears throat> it was around my birthday, they made it a two-day birthday celebration for me uh, with really, really lovely gifts. The most perfect gift that I could possibly want. Well, firstly, the most perfect gift was just to have their company and their cuddles. But Paul brought me a whole tray of brassicas. Oh my goodness. Beautiful, beautiful little plants. I haven't brought them in here to show you because they've got a soggy bot. They've been outside in the rain and I don't want to get wet. But they're in a module tray and he's brought that's a module of 15 and it matches this one which is a module of 4 by 2, 4, 6, 7, 28. This, it's super tough plastic. This will last for years. Now I know most of us don't want plastic in our lives. I certainly don't. However, something like this, it's going to last and last and last. The reason Paul got these was because he was using one. I just hang on a sec. Props show. Oh, cat bits. I have these. I don't know. Like this. This is just a whole stack of them. They've been home to be washed. But you can see they're really look. They're really flimsy. They fall apart. You know, I look after them as as well as I can to get the longest life out of them. But they're nowhere near as good as this. So Paul had had something similar, and he had a day where he just couldn't get his he just couldn't get his little plants out, and the whole thing's disintegrated. So he went on the hunt and found these. They've got nice big holes in the bottom, so you can where's my that one? So you can pop your uh, little plug plant out. Fabulous. Now I can't remember where he said he got them, so I will try and link the video in which he talks about them so if you want something like this you can find it too so the long and the short is i had a fantastic fantastic couple of days away uh got to see paul's new plot uh really the work started i think it was about the end of january to create this brand new garden visiting it i, I mean i was just Obviously I've been following it on YouTube over the last few months because I can't get there to see it in person. So I've been following it so I knew it was going to look great. But honestly when I got there I was so impressed. He's basically created a garden from nothing this year. Not just nothing. The, the plot he inherited was, it was horrible, it was so snarly, gnarly full of rubbish and weeds and to see it now you would think that garden has been on the go for two years it's brilliant maybe i should link that series of videos as well i don't know i'm not very good with these link things i'll find something to link so you can go over and have a look because i think especially with establishing the new garden for anyone in a similar situation i think it'll be really really useful for you to see how he did it and there's no two ways about it it's hard work he put in a lot of hard work but you know what if you want the rewards of a beautiful garden and beautiful veggies you've got to put in the work right it's on a sort of a similar note oh, are you sitting comfortably then we'll begin I am going to take you outside in a minute and we are going to do some practical gardening. Ah, because the other thing, just on the word of brassicas again, my poor Taunton Dean, which had been so fantastic, it has given me so many feeds, it's unbelievable. I mean, it was massive. I was having to prune it and give tons of it away. I could not keep on top of eating it. One of my local greengrocers uh, was very happy. I literally took two bin bags full of harvest to him so that he could add them to the veggie boxes they were taking out to vulnerable people for free at the beginning of the um, lockdown. Yeah, it's been fantastic. But then suddenly the pigeons found it. But worse than that, 
the white fly found it the whole thing was i mean it was it was vile it was covered in them and they'd sucked the life out of it so um i chopped all that out i mean it was so vile i've got one branch left so again when richard and paul were here i grabbed paul to say right where do i take my cuttings from because i'm going to try to take some cuttings and I'm always nervous about doing something for the first time if I've never seen it before. I like to see someone doing something. I like to read my books, that's how I learn. Watch, read, and apply that. So he's given me some clues. So we'll be doing that today, plus some, and this is all gonna feed into what I'm gonna talk about now, plus some cuttings of honeysuckle, and it's a native honeysuckle, can't wait to give that a go. So, for the longest time, right, I'm going to have to have a gulp of water because I'm about to talk a lot. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay. I've always, always gardened with the environment, with wildlife in mind. I've always had you know, half a mind, probably even more than half a mind, on thinking about my little micro-environment and the biodiversity in it and trying to sustain that and actually increase it. I'm very strictly organic, so for instance, as you all know by now, I, I insist on organic seeds too because, you know, some of these big non-organic seed companies with great swathes of land which aren't being managed organically even if I garden with those seeds in my garden organically, it's a drop in the ocean compared to all that land the big seed companies have. So organic seeds, etc. So everything I do, both in my garden and in life in general, I try to think in terms of having the lightest footprint on this planet. I love nature, I love wildlife, I, you know, I love all of it. I'm, I'm just a teeny tiny part of all of it. So, pardon me, I've always gardened with that in mind. Uh, so, yes, that's a given. I'm often thinking about, are there ways I could do more? Now, I'm quite limited. This is only a small space. It's a half plot, so I am limited in space to do things so whatever I do out there I try to do nicely for the uh, for all the little critters <coughs> on my site it's great we have loads of pockets of wildlife areas whether it's rotting wood piles for amongst others our stag beetles we've got a large pond great for our um, amphibious friends our water loving insects. We have myriad trees and shrubs around the site so we've got great cover for birds both for nesting and roosting. A lot of the shrubs you know they're, they're great food source for the birds. All these different things but I'm always thinking is there something more I can do? So uh, towards the end of May when I'd finally dug all but one <laughs> of my beds. I still hadn't done the rose bush bed at that point. <clears throat> I'd got to the stage where the beds were dark. It's time to start thinking about getting all my poles and my structures up. So at the end of last season, the poles I'd used for my bean arches, so that's the eight foot poles plus the three, four foot poles across the top. When I'd taken them down, I bundled them and stacked them all together. So I knew that's my bean arches section. When I'd taken down the cucumber frame, they all got put together. And then there's always odds and sods of other sticks around the plot as supports for tomatoes, what have you. <coughs> Excuse me. I was going to say I've got a frog in my throat. Hopefully there's a frog in the pond over there, the wildlife pond. So I was having a bit of a sort through my sticks and loads of my bamboo poles were just snapping and breaking. In fairness, the vast majority of them I'd either inherited when I arrived on this site however many years ago 
or they're ones that I've grabbed from the burn pile that someone else is throwing away. So they're all pretty old and brittle. And as I was kind of going through them and they were snapping off and snapping off, obviously if they're like that sort of height, that's useful as a row marker or even for things like supporting the tomatoes when they're first starting, when I've got them at home. But some of them were snapping even smaller. And I suddenly thought, oh yes, I need to make some more bee houses. So I need to have a proper go through all my bean poles and decide which ones are past it in terms of plant supporting. Set them aside, think about, I've got some scraps of wood in my trunk under my bum uh, to just sort of fashion a simple sort of box shape to get them all rammed into to make some more bee houses. Great, I don't know when I'll get round to it, but I will. So that thought was in my mind. In the back of my mind for ages, I've, I've often thought about trying to have some water in the garden, a little pond of some description. So uh, you all know, you've seen it in my herb bed, I have that bowl as the insect drinking station. Uh, the insects do drink from it frequently. The birds come down and drink from it, sometimes have a little bathe. The cats drink from it, the foxes drink from it. So it's serving a really good purpose. It is providing a water source for all the critters to drink from. But it's quite shallow. So when it's really hot and dry, uh, it can, you know, by the end of the day, it's on the verge of being empty through use and evaporation. Now, it's not too much of an issue because when the weather is like that, I'm usually down most evenings to water. So I top it up. Great. But I've been thinking here for ages about having a, a, a deeper bowl of water. And I'd always thought I've got nowhere on my site to have a pond. Because fundamentally, although I want to look after wildlife, this is a garden for growing food. Yes, I'm being selfish. This is for me and my food. And there are ponds all around we've got the big communal pond so I always kind of thought well I don't really have space so they'll just have to make do with other ponds but I think I might have found somewhere to put it and it's partly this has partly come about because of the Taunton Dean <laughs> dying a death at the hands of pigeons and white fly but also, and I love it, this, there's lots of strands here that are coming together to give me my beautiful vision in tapestry form, as it were. I rarely get to watch Gardener's World, rarely. But this year, I've managed to watch an episode. I missed the episode when they were saying goodbye to Nigel. I'm kind of glad I missed that episode because I would have been blobbing. So the episode I saw was about, it might have been about four weeks ago by now, but Adam was sinking these lovely big sort of galvanised metal tanks in his garden and using them both as a dip tank to water the garden, but also somewhere for wildlife. And I was thinking, ooh, can I do something like that? Thought was there. And then Paul, from Richard and Paul, a few days ago, a couple of weeks ago or so, he's got a washing up bowl sunk and already water snails have moved in. Where have they come from? But it's thriving with life already. It's just a washing up bowl. So he was filming his washing up bowl and sort of talking about, oh, I'd like to expand this area. I'd like a bigger bowl. And I was thinking, mm, this, is all, this is all coming at me from all different directions now. It's time. It's really time to think about it. So that whole wildlife thing. Ah, oh, and yes, back to that episode of Gardener's World. This year, because of lockdown, obviously they, they haven't been able to be out and about filming quite as much. So they have been, apparently, uh, they've been showing, firstly they've been showing viewers videos, sweet, but also they've been showing clips from gardens that they visited last year. And they showed a clip, and I remembered seeing it last year and I loved it. It's two lads, brothers, I don't know, early 20s, garden designers, and they are passionate about wildlife. 
they're passionate about you know these little tiny ecosystems in our gardens uh, they are wildlife gardeners but what I love is they are just as neat and precise as me yay um, and not that I'm always neat but what they were sort of what they were trying to impart was the idea that you can have a very formal beautiful garden with your flower borders you can have an elegant garden that's still super wildlife friendly and the point they're trying to make is that to have to have a wildlife friendly garden we need to create habitat for them we need to supply them with food we need to give our wildlife places to reproduce lay their eggs raise their offspring etc thinking about butterflies in particular and it's really interesting their attitude is just leaving just leaving your garden alone and not doing anything with it is not creating wildlife garden that's just being lazy and not doing your garden and that ties in with another program I saw last year um, I think it was done on five evenings over the course of a week it was hosted by Chris Packham and it was called something like the wildlife in your garden and they took a row of houses in suburbia that all had quite large back gardens I think they used about five or six different households and at the beginning of the week they sort of went in to look at each of the different gardens and at the end of the week and sorry and then through, throughout all of the week they were doing counts and, and observations etc etc to look at the number of different species of wildlife that were visiting or living in each garden. They had for example a uh, an older retired couple who had the most pristine beautiful immaculate garden with their roses and oh it was just gorgeous they had a family with youngish kids so the garden had swing set furniture in it and a seesaw and sand pit for the kids it was kind of chaos but they were still trying to make a garden so they had planted borders and trees and such like and then right on the end of the row, there was a lady who did nothing in her garden because she wanted it to be just for the wildlife. So it's full of grass and weeds and this sort of thing. And the grass was sort of, you know, nigh on a metre tall. So right at the beginning of the week, we were introduced to all these different gardens. And the presenters, as well as me, the viewer, it was kind of laying the bet that basically the wildlife garden, the lady with the the grass, the weeds, that is going to be absolutely chock full of critters. It's undisturbed, wonderful. Here's the thing. They got to the end of the week and the, I can't remember exactly which one it was, but it was one of the highly manicured gardens, had by far the majority of a number of species visiting and living. The wildlife garden had incredibly, by far, not just by far, but way, way, way down low, the least. And of course, it's back to what the two brothers I was just talking about are saying. It's that thing of the, the wildlife garden, the wild garden, there just wasn't food for them. She wasn't growing anything which was food for any of these creatures, whether it's insects, birds, mammals. Whereas in the manicured gardens, they, they'd introduced plants, they'd done a lot of planting, which happens to be attractive to our wildlife. So I think the point I'm trying to make, sorry, this is a long-winded way of saying it, please forgive me. Well, I'm not asking for your forgiveness, I'm just telling you what I'm up to, is every now and again, I have had criticism that, oh, your garden's too neat, you need to go to permaculture, you're wrecking the environment for the, mm, all this, that and the other, yeah, whatever. Um, I have a lot going on in my garden already by way of insects, and because I've got so many insects, I get so many birds, fantastic. I have so many plants in the garden which are really attractive to the insects. I mean, obviously the lavender. The lavender is a huge hit with all my, um, with the bees and the butterflies. 
all the calendula, the cosmos. That's why I've got flowers dotted everywhere. They may not be flashy flowers, but, you know, they do. Obviously, I've got my little bee houses, and you've seen from footage I've shown before, they get so busy in the spring, which is why I want to build some more. I, I pretty much, apart from, say, the lavender, which I harvest to use, and I do it towards the end of the season, so the bees have had a good go on it, a lot of my other plants I leave so that seed heads can form, because those seed heads are great food for so many whether it's insects or birds, well, birds. Um, grass paths, grass paths are a fantastic environment. You know, when I see the crows coming down and pe pe pecking, the green woodpecker who visits from time to time, hopping along like Professor Yaffle, pe pe pecking away. So I'm already doing quite a bit, considering it's a neat garden. It's neat, but it is not sterile, I can tell you that much. There's more I can do. So, don't just abandon half of your plot and think, oh, I've got a wildlife garden. You need to put something in there for food. You need to put something in there as a place for egg laying, etc., etc. Behind my shed, I've got, well, I have a really undisturbed area behind my shed. That's great. So, Without further ado, this has been a lot of ado, hasn't it? I just feel like, you know what? If I don't, <laughs> this is the bottom line, if I don't film for a week, by the time I do film, I'm like, <laughs> so much to catch up on. Oh, it's a happy life, isn't it, when so much is going on? But now I need to shut up, take her in the garden, and show you what my plans are for happy wildlife. Now, just to say as well, none of this is going to happen overnight because in terms of retaining water for my pond, I need to find a receptacle. I'm not going to, oh, what's that crawling on my cat? Oh, that's an interesting, it's either the bog just under the lens. What are you? I don't know, it might crawl across the lens in a minute, then you're gonna see its belly. Um, yeah, as far as the pond is concerned, it's not gonna happen overnight because I don't want to go out and buy something. You know me by now, that's not how I do things. I'll wait to scavenge something, um, whether it's a skip or, or I might find something in a charity shop. I'll be happy to pay then because I'll get something to give to the wildlife and the charity shop will get some money from me. Win win. Wind's picking up. Come on, let's go out so I can show you what my plans are. Just before I take you down the garden, oh, look at my neighbour's cosmos. They're so pretty. I just thought I'd show you this oh this is my lovely tray of plants from Paul so I've got these are the kale no sorry this is the purple sprouting broccoli and then seven cavolo nero lovely oh yum 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 so they'll sit there for a little while and then once the onions come out they can replace them okay so I'll let me take you down the garden path and show you what's what. Oh, sun's suddenly coming out, that's nice. It really is the most peculiar weather at the moment. It doesn't know what it's doing from one minute to the next. Oh, a pair of magpies, two for joy. Do you see them at the top of the path? One just passed, the other's hiding behind my sign. Oh, there it goes again. <laughs> okay, so, gosh, it's getting dusty suddenly. So this is where I'm planning some changes. Now, like I said, this has all come about from different strands of thoughts. Oh, where to start <laughs> to explain? Okay, let's start here. So this is the rhubarb that my mum gave me. Um, this is its second summer, it's been in 18 months. It's never really taken off here. Not sure why, but yeah, don't think it's happy. So I thought, right, that can move. The reason I thought that can move is because after the massacre of the Taunton Dean, <laughs> this is all that's left is this trunk. I mean, it really is a trunk. Let's see if I can show you in contrast, say, with my hand. Look, look at that. I mean, I can't, I can't fully get my hand around it. 
this is the one survivor this is what i'm going to take my cuttings from but yeah after this got massacred i thought right it's going to come out and then i thought oh because this little division of rhubarb has done quite well why don't i put my mum's rhubarb next to it and then this can just be my rhubarb bed yay fab because like i say that the other rhubarb my mum's rhubarb is not happy where it is so let's move it but then i thought oh where am i going to put a taunt and dean because i do want to take cuttings and then i also thought <laughs> these were all separate thoughts but then they all came together the uh the rosemary needs a massive prune again this bed which always has the self-seeded love and a mist in it I was looking at the other day and I got some grass creeping in and there's a bit of bindweed somewhere sort of downish here that comes each year and I give it a tug out but yeah I was thinking actually I could probably do with giving this bed a proper dig out again it hasn't been it has ne it's never been properly dug out uh so I thought, yeah, give it a proper dig out, clear the grass and bindweed out. I've got tons of, well, tons of the nigella seed will have dropped anyway, so it'll come back no problem. But then I thought, oh, I know. I step more to here. You can see in terms of the space, the rosemary. I want, to, I want to really prune this bit off, ideally. Sage needs a prune as well. And then I thought, well. Why don't I put the Taunton Dean in here? Because this bed is a kind of a permanent bed. I mean, it's only little, but it's permanent. I can put the Taunton Dean in here. This is the north end of the cold frame. So when, it, when it's massive, it's not going to block any light from the cold frame because the light always comes this way. <laughs> I can't point backwards. So I could put the Taunton Dean there. And I thought, yay, that's brilliant. So yes, Taunton Dean can go there. Then my mum's rhubarb can go there and hopefully it'll be happy with sort of cuddling up with this one. Also taking the Taunton Dean out hopefully means this is the grapevine. This was a pretty dead looking cutting from Gary a couple of years ago. It's never really done much until this year. So now I'm hoping that that's got its roots down too and it can get established to come up the fence. But I've got something else for the fence too. More of that in a second. Right, so rhubarb in there. And then that means back around to the front of the herb bed. I'm going to have a hole here. And I was thinking about plants and sort of some more, maybe where you can see I've got all this creeping thyme. Some low plants that will sit happily under the lavender because the lavender does really well you can see it massively takes over i'm happy for that and then i suddenly thought that vivi is where you can put your pond perfect because the animals the insects the birds they all know about this water <laughs> i'm sure they know i mean they come and use it so I'm sure it's part of that thing of they come to rely on a water source. Once you put a water source out, they'll rely on it. So they already know to come here. And actually, where's the end of my path? The end of the path is sort of halfway under that bowl. It's propped up with some wood. So from here, pretty much to, well, here, I could have quite a big bowl in there. I was thinking almost like, you know, like a baby bath. So yeah, like I say, it's not going to happen in a hurry. I will, I'm going to get that Taunton Dean dug out because it's going to be an effort and the end of the cold frame dug out. I think I'm going to wait until the autumn to move this rhubarb because I don't want to, like I say, it's never done particularly well and I don't want to really, really kind of, oh, I don't know, <laughs> make it give up and die. So I'll wait till the autumn. And that will hopefully give me enough time to find some sort of bowlage to sink into the herb bed to provide even more for the wildlife. Ah, and like I was saying, back to this end of the fence. So hopefully starting sort of compost end to come this way is 
Let me show you. My neighbour has this lovely, it's a native honeysuckle. <clears throat> Pretty. Does it smell? Hold on a sec. Get my big chanel's. Oh yes, yeah, beautiful scent. You can see how, if I show you along the line of the fence, it always kind of, basically, it always needs cutting back a bit in the summer. There's masses to cut back. But look at this. <laughs> I'm having to, I'm having to dodge this. This is my wheelbarrow full of my rose cuttings from this morning that I haven't done anything with. So there's some really beautiful growth on there. So rather than just cutting this all back and it being composted I'm going to try to take some cuttings from it and uh, like I said because I think it's a native one that should suit all the little critters who come on by and I think that would be absolutely gorgeous just coming back around again trying not to do too quickly on this end of the fence to come along and that will still give me that end of the fence for a chopcha in future years. But then this whole end of the garden will be even more wildlife friendly. Yay! <laughs> oh, I can't wait, can't wait. I will have to be a bit patient, like I said, because I've got to source things. And oh, look at this hyssop. Isn't this a beauty? It's supposed to be a purple hyssop, but it's half purple half white. That one over there is a fully white one. I love purples and whites. I didn't put any calendula in this year but it could do with that little pop of orange from calendula just to make these purples sing even more. Oh no I've got a couple of self-seeded calendula down here. That will help it pop. So yeah that is the plan. So first things first, it's time to <laughs> have a cuddle. No, first things first, it's time to do the Taunton Dean cuttings and the honeysuckle cuttings. I'm aiming to take four cuttings today. Now ideally, when you're wandering around the garden taking your cuttings, you'd want a jar of water, take around a jar of water with you to put your cuttings straight into the water. <clears throat> until you can get back to your potting shed to pop them up. I don't have anything to put any water in. And besides, I'm not going to be long. So, I'm looking for this. This is beautiful, really healthy, vigorous new growth. That one looks like a good candidate. Yeah, lovely. So I'm just gonna cut below. Oh, that's not the best note. I'm gonna cut below this leaf node here just below. Perfect. Right, four more like that, then let's go and get them potted up. Oh, which to choose, which to choose. I'm going to turn you off while I choose. So I've got my little cuttings. I've actually ended up with six. Now, ideally, I wouldn't have them with flowers on. I don't want that. I don't want the plant putting effort into that. So there's a couple like that. Um, Maybe I needed to have caught them sooner. We'll see. I'm going to give them a go anyway. So, I cut them just below the, this little leaf node. I'm just going to take off bottom one, two, upla. Maybe the next two as well. Just take those off. And then, I was going to say hormone rooting powder. It's not hormone rooting powder same effect it's an organic rooting powder essentially it's seaweed and I can't get the lid off yeah I don't want to be using hormones but I want to give it a good start so I'm just gonna just dip the end in the rooting powder and then boop, just firm it into the edge of the pot there and a repeat so, <laughs> I don't quite know how this happened today, but my camera battery is about to die. 
it's, it's not going to last for me showing the um, show me doing the Taunton Dean cuttings. So I'll leave it there for today. When I do the Taunton Deans, I'm also because I'm so curious, I can't wait. I'm going to do my first potato reveal. So what I'm planning to do, because by then they'll have had 90 days. This is for my new potatoes. Oh, by the way, just to say with the cuttings, once they're all in now, I'll give it a bit of a watering and I'm just gonna leave it here on the table. It's warm, it's a bit protected sort of from the worst of the winds, they should be fine. Yes, I'm going to dig up some new potatoes from the bed and I'm also going to tip out the potatoes that I've got in the growing bag on the deck so we can have an immediate kind of compare and contrast of how they've both done. <laughs> can't wait, can't wait, can't wait. And if you remember a few weeks ago I had my broad beans out. I will be having broad beans and potato salad. <laughs> can't wait, can't wait. It'll be the first sort of like fresh scoff this year. I've had a few bits and pieces. Obviously the purple sprouting broccoli, da da da. But I always think of that, even though I was eating it in March, I kind of think of it as last year's harvest because it was planted last year. Anyway, so, good luck little honeysuckles. I hope this works because it will be lovely to have this on the fence, you know, somewhere down the line when it's really established, it will be a great place for a really small nesting bird. It'll be a great place for the birds, a little bird to have a little roost in. Oh, it's it's just going to be great in every possible way. So fingers crossed that at least one of these roots. Huh. Okay, my lovelies. So I know that's quite a long, talky, chatty one today. Uh, but I just wanted to sort of... I, I'm so excited to, to do a few changes. You know, the garden has been pretty well established. Oh, excuse me. It's been pretty well established for the last two years. So... It is fun every now and again to shake things up a bit, change things around a bit. And it's really great for me to be able to talk about that to you all and share that with you. And then let's, let's see how it progresses over the autumn and into the winter. <sighs> really looking forward to it. Right, I need to stop talking before this just goes, hmm. <laughs> so. I will see you again really soon. We'll get the Taunton Dean cuttings done. We'll do the potato reveal from the growing bag. There's other stuff on the list I've completely forgotten already. There's always something on the list though, isn't there? There's always something to keep us out of mischief and in the garden. Yay! Cheerio, lovely people. See you soon. <laughs>